Are you looking for an innovative way to solve problems and bring your team together? In this video, we're gonna teach you all about how to give a design thinking workshop. Hi, I'm Jeff, head of design at Career Foundry. Be sure to give us a like and subscribe to our channel. Now design thinking is an interesting idea because it's taking what designers know and do and letting other people do it. But design is something that we should all be doing and something that we should be sharing. So it's a really interesting concept and it's super popular, it's gained a lot of traction. So many people's first experience with design is actually through design thinking. But don't get caught up too much on the terminology. If you're a designer, you'll feel this, you'll know this intuitively. If you're not a designer, you're basically just teaching people an intro to design. So everything that you teach them, they're gonna be excited about. So you can feel confident knowing that this workshop will be a fun experience. Now, of course, some of you might have already run some design thinking workshops. If you have any tips about running design thinking workshops of your own, please leave them down in the comments. We'd love to hear about them. A design thinking workshop has three pretty huge benefits. First of all is creative problem solving in action. Secondly, design thinking workshops facilitate innovation and teamwork. The very creative nature of it is thinking outside of the box and coming up with innovative solutions. Lastly, as well as facilitating innovative solutions, it teaches creative thinking, which can be a hugely strategic advantage for companies. So now that we know the what and why of running design thinking workshops, let's look at how you can plan for these workshops. First thing you wanna do when you're preparing for the design thinking workshop is set the objective. Now you need to know exactly why you're running this design thinking workshop. Maybe you wanna create a new product or maybe you wanna optimize an existing product and you just wanna make it better. Imagine you're working for a company called Love Foundry, an online dating service. The goal of a design thinking workshop for Love Foundry might be to better understand the onboarding, the initial experience that users have with the app. So you could focus on that for your design thinking workshop. Next, you wanna find a space for your workshop. And it can't just be any meeting room. It has to be a place that has really good lighting, comfortable seating, and you might wanna even consider some nice music for your workshop. You're trying to get people into a creative mindset, so think about that when you're looking for a place for your workshop. Now for a crucial part of the planning phase, the agenda. The agenda is gonna be a list of all the things you'll be doing for your workshop day. Now, golden rule number one of making an agenda is don't overfill it. You're gonna be surprised, you're never gonna have enough time for anything, so make sure that you give lots of space in your agenda items. And second golden rule of agendas is make sure that each agenda item is based on an activity something action related, something they're gonna be doing during the day. Now, okay, you're making your agenda, but what is the time frame? Now, ideally you get as much time as possible. I've done a design thinking workshop in four hours. It, it was pretty packed. I'd recommend doing an all day workshop. Um, now that, that you would probably wanna block out nine to five, but the, the workshop itself might be more like 10 to four with breaks for lunch and you know breaks between. So just keep in mind how long your agenda is gonna be for. Um, and we definitely recommend doing an all day design thinking workshop. So now that you've got your agenda set, it's time to think about the materials you'll need for the workshop. So there's some digital materials you're gonna need. First, most simple digital material is a watch. I definitely recommend a watch so you can time things, check what's going on. Um, of course, you're gonna have your phone with you, which is a good thing. You can use your phone to take photographs during the workshop. Um, if you have a Bluetooth speaker, you can actually control the music from across the room. So you can take a photo really quickly and pause the playlist all in one go. Um, this is also super helpful. And if you're gonna be running the workshop all day, I definitely recommend having some slides and a slide deck, um, something like Keynote. Um, you can have that on your laptop and that can be projected onto, onto the wall or it can maybe be a TV screen. Um, regardless, you're gonna be away from your laptop laptop and the wall and the screen. So you're gonna probably wanna have a clicker, um, maybe some sort of USB thing that plugs into your laptop. Then you can control the slides from all the way across the room. You can control the music. You can take photos of lovely people doing design thinking and you'll be all set that way. With your digital materials and tools for yourself ready, it's time to think about the materials you're gonna to need to provide for the participants. Because when you run a workshop, you also bring the supplies that they're gonna need. So things we recommend would be post-it notes, always post-it notes. Markers for the post-it notes. It's better than using a pen on the post-it notes because if you use a marker on the post-it notes, you can see it from far away. So people in the back of the room can see what was written on the wall. So that's a nice combination. Another nice combination is of course paper and pens. So you're gonna be sketching and doodling. Um, you need to have lots of paper on hand so people can try something, throw it out, try it again. Um, in addition, you're gonna need some tape 
So people are gonna be drawing things and putting them on the wall. And when they put this on the wall with the tape, they're also gonna probably wanna vote on things. So you're gonna need some of those little dot votes. They're gonna be different color stickers that are circular. Um, you're gonna use those for different things um, like whose idea was the best, vote with your dot vote. So you can use these stickers to do things like vote. In addition, you might wanna consider having a whiteboard around. You never know when you need to illustrate a concept or maybe you wanna keep track. Um, maybe you wanna have something like points for the day. Um, you can use the whiteboard to keep track of things like that. So now that you have your sort of materials you're gonna be working with with your hands, you also need to consider things to eat. So when you're running an all day workshop, it's gonna be important to have snacks lying around. And I don't just mean any snacks. We're not talking like donuts and you know Skittles and things like that. What we want is healthy snacks, right? You can't afford to have a bunch of sugar crashing while you're doing this design thinking workshop. So take all the things like the supplies, the snacks, and kind of put them throughout the room, arranged neatly, um, but kind of in different spots so that they feel like they can help themselves to them throughout the day. Now that you have all the physical things set, you've got the space, the agenda, the supplies, the materials, and the snacks, it's time to talk about how to conduct the workshop. The first thing you wanna have is an introduction, where you're gonna give a nice brief overview of what you're gonna be doing throughout the day. This will set the expectations for everyone. When you show something like the introduction, um, it's good to see how they feel about this and you can kind of gut check what they thought they'd get out of the workshop versus what you thought they'd get out of the workshop. So it's a really very crucial, important part of the workshop. And don't forget, if you're gonna be filming or taking photos of the workshop, you need to get their consent up front. So make sure that they're all okay with having their face um, photographed and wherever you'll be posting it. Might even be good to indicate where you're gonna be posting these photos and what you're doing with them exactly. And if it's in you know, maybe a more corporate environment, you might wanna even have a written consent form so that everyone's aware of the data policy of your workshop. So the first real action of the workshop, you wanna do something bold, you wanna do something that wakes them up, you wanna do something to get the blood pumping and start getting them to be a bit more collaborative. None of this sitting in the chair and watching you talk at them, that's not what a workshop is, that's a TED talk. You're doing a workshop. So what you wanna do is do an icebreaker. This might sound a bit cheesy to you, you might be like, oh, that's what we do in summer camp when we were kids, but this is a really great way to get everyone up um, because actually what people do is sit in little clusters around their friends. An icebreaker gets them up, they start walking around the room, interacting with people, they loosen up, they start to have fun, maybe a little smile comes across their face. So icebreakers are a really great way to get a workshop going. I recommend you jump into them as quickly as possible. Um, what are some good icebreakers? You can obviously look online, but um, something that I've seen work really well is just do rock, paper, scissors games. So you say everyone does rock, paper, scissors with each other in little pairs. Now the key is, once you win at rock, paper, scissors, you move on to the next person. But once you lose at rock, paper, scissors, you have to cheer for the person that just beat you. So as people go through, you end up with just two people and everyone's cheering and everyone's excited. And everyone's watching it like it's really interesting, fun drama of human life, but really you're just getting them to get their blood pumping, getting them walking around. So something like this will be a nice way to get everyone ready for the sort of collaborative, you know, positive, encouraging workshop environment that you wanna create. So when you're going through a design thinking workshop, you wanna go in the actual phases of the design thinking process. Now you don't wanna start at step five and work backwards, you wanna start at step one and go all the way to step five. So step one is empathy. And this is super important for designers. You wanna put yourself kind of in the shoes of the user who's gonna be using your app or service or anything like that. So this is a good thing to start with. Get in the workshop, you got the icebreaker, everyone's excited to work, and now they need to get their mindset into the same as the user. So there's a couple ways we can do this. Um, you don't always have enough room in your workshop to bring all your users into that space. So you can do some things to kind of approximate the feelings that the users are having with the app. So let's take our example of Love Foundry. Now, how do you get your workshop participants to feel like single users who are looking for love using an app? Well, you know, you can start off by having them interview each other. So you pair them up, you know, get everyone to sit down together and you can give them a set of questions to ask or you can just let them sort of free flow. But have them say something like, um, you know, what was your last experience with a dating app? How did that feel? How could you improve the experience? And ask very open-ended questions like that. None of this yes, no thing. And then the other person can be responding and that can be some sort of them approximating a user. So then the person who's doing the interviewing can also take notes. And when they're taking these notes, they can use a framework. 
This is something we do a lot in design. Um, just a way to categorize what's being said, so that's kind of a way that you can kind of understand it. So one of the nice frameworks that we like to use is saying, thinking, doing, and feeling. So it kind of starts at the visual on the face. What are they saying? What's the literal words coming out of their mouths? Um, what are they doing? Um, maybe what's their um, behaviors? What is their body language like? Um, you know, are they cocking their head to the side? Um, these are all like the doing. So saying and doing is a bit more obvious. Um, and then thinking and feeling is a layer below. So that's one way to get uh, into the empathetic mindset. Another way would be to get an empathy map. So empathy, empathy map is kind of like a poster. You can put these on the wall and then what they do is they show like a persona, or like a stick figure drawing, some sort of approximation of the user. Um, and then it's divided up into different quadrants around it. So it's also four things, but they're slightly different. So you have the empathy map on the wall and the first thing they look at is what they're seeing. So say, okay, for our Love Foundry users, what are they seeing? You know, uh, what's, what's in their life? What's going on visually for them? Um, the next thing is hearing, so they think about what are the users hearing. As you can tell, it's kind of getting them to, to role play, get them in the, the real mindset of the user just by doing these two things. Uh, in addition to that, you can talk about what they're saying and doing, that's also part of the empathy map. Um, and then also there's thinking and feeling. So it's got some of the similarities there, but in one approach, you're having someone interview and either give their real life experience or what they think the experience is like. And another one, they have something on the wall and then as a group, you kind of fill out what the user might be going through. So those are two nice ways to get an empathy mindset right away in your design thinking workshop. So now that you have two activities for the empathy stage, it's time to move on to the second stage. And the second stage is define. So what you're gonna do is something called reframing. And this is a really clever way to do problem solving in a creative way. So it's like you kind of make your mind shift into thinking about something from multiple perspectives. Now, if you did the interview approach that I talked about earlier, each person will have kind of paired up and interviewed another person. So they'll all have notes. Inside those notes will be insights. So it'll be interesting to sort of try and find the things they learn. Insight is just something you learn from some research or some interview. So you take those insights and you move into something called a point of view statement. So this is something where it says a user needs something and it's because of an insight. So what you're gonna say um, for the Love Foundry example, um, maybe there was um, people writing busy a lot. So your insight could be, um, for instance, that uh, people are very busy and that's part of the reason people use dating apps because um, it helps them to fit it into their lives. So, you know, the busyness of these, these people's lives. Middle-aged urban professionals are looking for love on their phones because they have very busy lives. There's your point of view statement. Now what you wanna do, um, that's a reframe, right? So now you're thinking about what the, would happen to interviews a bit differently. Now we can do another reframe and to put it into a how might we statement. How might we's are a really nice way to reframe things from problems into challenges. And they're really great because the way the, the, the verbiage used is, is really uh, clever. It's how, uh, it means you haven't jumped to the solution. You don't know what's gonna happen yet. So how is great for that. Might, um, it's meaning um, it's a possibility. Um, you know, like it's something that could happen. And then we, it's very inclusive. So it's saying, how might we together, how might we do something about this challenge? So the how might we statement for Love Foundry might be, how might we uh, provide a safe, easy dating experience for urban professionals that are super busy. So you're kind of reframing it again, right? The how might we is an action by providing some sort of product or service, and then again it mentions the target demographic. So that's kind of how the how might we works. And the reason you do a how might we at the define stage is you're gonna to wanna to get everybody on board, maybe you have teams, you know, something like that. Um, you might wanna get the teams on board for what they're gonna work on. And the define phase is a good time to bring in some decision making. So you can have everyone put their how might we's on the wall, and then you know those dot votes we talked about, those little blue stickers, um, you can have them put those onto the ideas on the how might we's, and that way they can vote on what they wanna work on. So at the define phase, it's a really good time as an activity to have them you know, do point of view statements, have them do how might we statements to reframe, and then it's also really nice to have them vote on what they're gonna work on. Of course, they could all work on their own how might we, but it's nice to, in a workshop environment to have people working together. So I recommend doing teams, having teams work on one how might we. So from the, this point on, these people might be working on the same idea together. And a how might we is a really nice way to make sure that you have the right idea and it's for the right person and make sure that's very specific. The more specific, the better. 
Okay, so you have some activities you can do in the empathy stage, um, also the define stage, but what about the ideate stage? So stage three is ideate. And this is time to break out some of those artistic design-y type skills that you kind of figured you're gonna be doing in the design thinking workshop. This is thinking visually. It's basically sketching novel solutions to the challenge you've already decided on. Now, this phase will be kind of polarizing for non-designers, which you'll definitely be doing uh, this for non-designers. So what you wanna uh, understand is that not everybody at their daily job sketches and doodles. Um, that's something that only us designers get to do on a daily basis. So be aware that a lot of them are gonna feel a little bit unsure of their artistic skills. So you wanna make sure that you set a very safe space. So when you talk about the fact that you're gonna have them sketch anything, they're gonna maybe clam up a bit. So you wanna say things like, um, there, there's no artistic skills required here, it's not important how it looks, it's important that you're just thinking visually. And that's what you're wanting them to do. You wanna get them in the mindset of someone who's just you know, thinking, how can I solve that, how might we, and they just visually show it. It could be a diagram, it could be a stick figure, actually stick figures are really, really nice at this stage. So what you wanna do is just have them sketch a few solutions to this how might we. Um, it's early, it's not gonna be perfect. It's not important how it looks or that it actually solves the problem right. You just wanna get something. And then the next thing you can do is have them get feedback on their sketches. And not only just get feedback, but have them explain their sketches to somebody else. And in this process, they'll be diving deeper into thinking. And this is where some of this really creative problem solving will come out. Um, just the sheer act of trying to visualize something can kind of get your brain working in new ways. And also the, uh, the act of presenting something can help you understand better the idea you're trying to flesh out. So in the ideate phase, you can do some of these activities. So sketching, um, getting feedback, sketching again, doing this over and over until people start to feel happy with the, uh, the ideas they're starting to generate. Now for the fun part. We're at the fourth phase now. And the fourth phase is prototype. So depending on how much time you have here, there are a couple different ways that you can prototype. So if you have you know, something like two hours, maybe a bit more, you could do something kind of high fidelity. Um, and that could be maybe you take a, a quick, you know, easy tool that everyone understands like Keynote, which is not a design software, right? It's for non-designers. Um, and maybe you could you know, prototype quickly some of the sketches they did earlier into something that's almost like an app, you know, like jump straight to the full experience. You could do something like that, but since you're working with non-designers, you know, gauge the room, see what the kind of skill is in the room. Um, there's also a nice tool called Prot. Uh, what Prot lets you do is you can make sketches of screens on paper, and Prot is a mobile app. You just take pictures of each sketch, and then you can turn that into a clickable prototype that feels real, even though it's you know just pencil maybe um, scanned in and using a photo. So like they can basically have the entire experience of the app using just this prototyping tool called Prot. And those are two like maybe activities you could do for people that have a bit of design experience or you know ones you feel confident can work with digital tools like that. If you don't have as much time, you can also do things like make storyboards. Storyboards is just turning uh, something that's a static visual into multiple visuals. So it kind of starts the process of things going from just one image to a video. And the way that we experience you know services, apps, products, things like that, it's more like a movie than it is a picture. So you wanna start to get to that kind of feeling. You want to make their ideas, which they sketched out in the last phase, in the ideate phase, take, take them from something static, you know, simple into something that's moving, something that's like an experience. So at this point, prototype, it's all about learning by doing. You want to be doing things here. You want to be making things. That's why it's the fun phase. Um, for a lot of people, they never had the opportunity to prototype. So it's going to be a really interesting moment for you to watch people prototyping. It's going to be like, oh wow, I just had something that was a small sketch on a piece of paper and suddenly it feels real. And that's the whole point of the prototype phase. So coming back to the Love Foundry example, what we're trying to do here is help busy people find love on this app. So it's more of a product, right? So let's, let's think about storyboarding. So storyboarding could be a really nice way to prototype this uh, how might we challenge we're trying to solve. So what you could do is, you know, the, the key here is that they're having a busy, busy day. So maybe the storyboard, you could kind of map out what that busy day is. And by doing this, you're getting into that sort of experience that, that you want to get at when you're prototyping. And you'll be thinking about the user, you'll be thinking about little moments where you can use Love Foundry to, you know, help them find love throughout their busy day. So this is a perfect, idea, uh, perfect activity for, you know, prototyping things in the design thinking workshop. So this is a fun one. Um, it's pretty visual, um, doesn't require a lot of artistic skills though, because it can literally just be stick figures and do about something like 10 to 20 different steps and you can prototype those things out like that. Oh yeah, and don't forget, you can also just have them act it out. 
A lot of people don't feel comfortable making things like storyboards or sketches or you know apps, things like that, if they're maybe you know not the, the visually or you know technologically inclined. You can just have them acted out because you know what better way to experience a service than when it's acted out right in front of you. Now for the final phase, the test phase. Now this phase is gonna feel kind of familiar because it's kind of all about getting feedback. But here it's a bit different because now the solution is gonna be pretty fully fleshed out, you know? If you've done something like a storyboard or maybe prototyped a, you know, sort of an app experience, it's gonna be ready to show. And this part is all about getting someone new um, to test this thing for the first time. So if you had groups before, you wanna get someone from a different group testing. So you've got your idea, it's ready. Um, maybe it's a service that's acted out. Maybe it's a product that's storyboarded out. So you have that, that, that's, that kind of experience ready. You wanna bring someone in to experience it for the first time. So what's great about that is this person has never experienced that before. So they're gonna be able to give you really good kind of firsthand how it feels kind of feedback. And, and that's gonna be a really great time to capture all that feedback so that you can improve what's happening. Um, a really nice way to think about capturing that feedback is to take notes, again, structured into four different things. So you wanna take notes about what was working, so that's always important. You wanna affirm what was happening. You wanna make sure the team knows that the thing that they did is working well. Also, what's not working? So maybe the person who's testing this out says, this part's not working for me. Uh, also, maybe I didn't understand that, so it's just not working for me. You get those two things um, figured out. So the positive, the negative, right? What's working, what's not working. Also, if they have questions, the questions they ask will be very insightful. So you also wanna capture all the questions they have. If they're confused about something and they ask a question, it's probably a good chance that that team didn't quite you know, sort out that, so that part of the experience. Uh, also, this is also really, a important point is to capture the ideas. So when someone tests something for the first time, they're gonna have really good ideas on how to improve it immediately. It just sort of flows out. They're like, oh, you could try this thing here. The really good thing to do is capture that immediately because that's gonna be not just feedback, but ways to turn that feedback into actually things that can improve. So between those four things, what's working, what's not working, questions and ideas, you can get a pretty good understanding of the experience that you're uh, prototyped before. So that's what the test will give you. Really solid, actionable feedback that you can turn into making whatever you've done better. Now, that would be the end of the five phases of a design thinking workshop. In real life, design thinking itself is cyclical. So you might go, you know, one, two, three, four, five, and then bounce back to three, and then four and five. Um, but in a workshop, it's gonna be very structured. You're gonna go one, two, three, four, five, right? Um, that would be the end of the workshop. So, you know, what do you do after that? Basically, what you've created is a fully fleshed, tested uh, idea that can be built. So um, after the workshop, you know, the next day at work, you can just start working on that product. So you're gonna have something that's, you know, very sketchy, but has some feedback and it's fleshed out. So that's kind of the whole point of a design thinking workshop. So I've just walked you step by step through an entire design thinking workshop. But design thinking itself was created in the 90s. Um, I'm curious, do you think that design thinking workshops are still relevant? We'd love it if you let us know in the comments whether you think this kind of workshop is still something you would do. To learn more about running design thinking workshops, head on over to our blog. You can find the link in the description below. Thanks for watching, see you next time.